Hello and welcome to the Large and Unnecessary First Player Token Podcast. This is episode 87. My name is Chris. I'm David. I'm Pavel. No you in today. <gasps> He's disappeared off the face of the planet. So uh, we were going to do our unnecessary quiz this week, but we're going to have to leave it, I'm afraid, lads. No. It's quite okay. I would have no. lost anyway. So I feel like a winner just <laughs> I don't because know. I'm not I don't lost. know. Because the thing is that a lot of these questions in this quiz, and I'm going to start bigging it up now, um, they're all just like, they're all... I would say they all have a bit of a vintage retro feel to them. Oh my god, um, are you saying I'm old? Yes, and uh, I think that there's some topics in there that you might answer like better than some other people. I'd say that there's there's a lot of games in there that I, I played as a kid that you also played as a kid. Yeah, but this um, thing, the thing is... There's also an entire Retro Games Boot Club section in this quiz as well, so... I don't really have any knowledge of, like, developers, studios, producers... That's all right, neither, neither do I, so... Oh, that's good then. The, the, a lot of the questions, some of them are utterly bizarre questions that I'd, I'd be amazed... There's one question in particular in there, I'll be amazed if any of you get it. <laughs> but, um... But it is one of the hard questions, so you know, because I have ranked the questions, and, and, and well, we'll get to the rules of that. But like, the quiz will be coming probably in the next video games episode. We also have a retro games boot club um, game that we should probably have been talking about this week, but we're not gonna. Um, what's that game called again, Dave? Ecstatica. Ecstatica, that's the one. We're not talking um, about it because nobody's Pavel played it, and Ewan are lazy bastards. <laughs> I am being blamed uh, for Ewan. It's all his fault. It's Ewan's <laughs> fault. Blame the man that's in absentia. That's that's the tradition. No, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll yeah. get to it. So in the meantime, we're just going to talk, have a normal video games episode this week. Um, as normal as it gets. As normal as it gets, yes. Uh, so we're just going to talk about some games that we've played, uh, chat about that for a bit, and then we'll go, go and have our tea. Mmm. Uh, which in this country doesn't necessarily mean beverage. I mean, honestly, people, uh, like, you, you, tea is a hot beverage, not a bloody meal. I think it depends on how working class you are as well. Ah, right. What you call it? I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 a working class of a particular kind. <laughs> where, where does that class fit? In? <laughs> <laughs> just you, just below the scum of the earth. Below me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're below me then? There you go. <laughs> Right, okay, let's talk about some video games. So first up, um, we're going to talk about something which... Um, now, I am right in saying that this is by the same people that uh, made this War of Mine. Very much so. Yes, because um, it, it definitely feels like <laughs> they made this game. So I'm talking about Frostpunk. Yeah, because um, things aren't depressive, depressive enough, uh, depressing. Let's yeah. make let's, let's make, make something things that even more depressing. Really bring you down. <laughs> so we like to uh, we we like to tag games with the word punk. Uh, on, on this podcast and I'm not sure if we've used the term Frostpunk before no no we've not but you know what I was actually thinking about the very title because the, the, the whole idea about like because it all started obviously with cyberpunk and the, the thought there was that the, the, the cyber element of the word was causing some say counterculture aspects in whatever setting you know uh, you were you were playing or reading about my point is uh, the, the 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 punk word was all about counterculture caused uh, by whatever the first component of the word is. In this particular case, it was cybernetics or whatever advanced uh, technology. So in Frostpunk, it does actually sort of make sense because the, yes. the, the 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 climate sort of circumstances that you find yourself in uh, necessitate uh, certain types of, I suppose, culture changes. So it it works if you ask me. It does. I mean, you're right because because what this game is all about it's about uh, it's set in the sort of late nineteenth century, but it does have a. I mean, it has a steampunk feel to it. I mean, it's, there's definitely steampunk going on here. So you do have all the clockwork stuff going on, all the gears and the the steam engines and all that kind of thing. Um, 
the only part of non well the the it deviates from your standard steampunk in a way that steampunk tends to be very sort of pretty with uh, these elaborate uh, aesthetics top hats yes, and, yes, yes. and goggles and tesla guns and and you name it and probably even magic of some sort or definitely some sort of crazy alchemical magic whereas this one is very sort of down to earth, very gritty, grim, and in general, just children are dying on the streets and step over <laughs> well, we'll their bodies. We'll get to that, Pavel. I mean, you're jumping way ahead here. Um, but that's the goal of the game. But yeah, so, so so it's a steampunk setting, is what I'm saying. But it's a steampunk setting in which the world has gone through what's probably the opposite of global warming. So it's just massive global cooling. And then I think the average temperature reaches something like minus 20 in the south of England. Um, which is your general spring in Poland, but it's fine. <laughs> Now, what happens in this is that there's a very a very good intro to this game. Um, I thought the intro for this was excellent. It really set the tension. It really set the scene. It had it had very um, what's it twenty eight days later style music that built up to a kind of crescendo. Like production values in general yes. are very good. Um, and in, in this intro, it doesn't answer any big questions. It just sets a scene for you. Look, the world has cooled down. You're a bunch of survivors from London. Um, who are making their way north to find the what happened to the people that went out to look and find out why the world cooled down. And they went north. So it doesn't actually say exactly where you end up, but from what I've gathered from playing the game, you have left the British Isles. Yeah, because um, yeah, you go north from And that, you go yeah. quite far north. Uh, so I'm assuming that you've probably you've gone to the Arctic or something like that, um, where it is at its coldest. Now, what happens is that you fight, you come across a massive generator um, which is already built in a massive crater in the ground. So you're you're uh, you, what you're doing is it's. I mean, the game's essentially a city builder, and you're essentially just building up a a colony or a city, or they call it the last city on Earth, um, inside this crater. Uh, so yeah, you find this generator, and you basically have control of a small group of survivors, whoever has made it basically to that point in the crater. And the idea here is that you're gonna have to survive here. And also find out what happened to all these people that came here to find out, uh, to discover like why the world cooled down and if they could reverse it. Um, and this has become because, like I say, that this is why I mentioned like that the this war of mine, mm-hmm. like the, the, these people made this game because this game is grim, like it is so grim. Like because this war of mine was one of the like it was an excellent game, but it was one of the most depressing gaming experiences I've ever had. You wouldn't like, start playing this game if you were like really having a down day. Oh yeah, if you were having a bad day, you don't want to start. And it's the same with Frostpunk. I mean, I wouldn't play this game if you were having a bad time. Like, don't play this when you're hungover or anything, like because you will probably be crying by the, <laughs> <laughs> like about an hour into it or something. Um, but it's just this this company seems to have such an amazing ability to just like put you into that situation like such a grim situation and make you feel it like make you really feel that every single decision that you make in these games in both these games in this war of mine and frostbunk um is agonizing and has massive consequences yeah because i mean they're very different games obviously this world of this war of minus is, is i'm not even sure how you would describe the the genre the, i think the it's topic. just that, i would call that just a survival game yeah maybe yeah something like it's, that it's pretty uh, basic survival game Whereas but done really really well definitely a, a a city builder but uh they both in their own way like really excel at storytelling and city builders normally are very sort of i mean every single time i play anno 2205 i play it to like for rel- relaxation uh there isn't really any um, story to it and there wouldn't even be a way to tell a story really or there is some sort of just backstory but that, that's that's that whereas this game with every passing moment there's something happening that really yeah. immerses you yeah, yeah. and I was I, I was actually quite I must say surprised positively surprised by, by the amount of like random events happening because oh, yeah. I've started playing this without a single clue what to do and how and I was actually a little bit sort of terrorized by the very setting I'm like oh my god everyone's because you, normally you sort of get distressed when, when, when you know that you're failing at a certain whatever stage <laughs> of a game whereas you start this game knowing well that your group of survivors each of them with a bloody face and a bloody name so you already feel for them and they bloody freezing straight away you have no idea yes. what to do Jesus. I mean, I, th- I think I mean you, you, you've hit on something there because I think like you're saying when you said well, about failing I think this game somehow has a ridiculous ability to make it feel like you're always failing <laughs> like and yet somehow you've got through a day you've got through the next day you've yeah. got through the next day and but you never feel like you're winning at this game like it just throws so much at you um 
I want to actually get into some more of the detail about how this game works. I mean, what, one of the things that I loved about this game, now my computer is getting on a bit. It's not, right, you know, I've, I've, put, I've put everything on medium settings. I'm getting 30 frames a second out of it. That's that's fine with me. No, no, um, I was just... This is this is actually my first experience of the game was trying to run it, waiting 15 minutes, yeah. switch, switching the PC off. I had that same changing experience. Changing settings, it. yeah. yeah. Um, it wouldn't load the first time I tried mm-hmm. to play it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, since I switched it to medium, I've had no problems with it. Okay. Um, other than sometimes, and I think this might just be my computer being weird, and I told you about this, Dave, that uh, sometimes when I quit this game, the computer claims I don't have a graphics card anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh <laughs> I'll have to restart. But I think that's just my computer. Oh, <laughs> but, um, that's taking it far. <laughs> but yeah, I'm running with, like medium settings. I'm getting 30 frames a second, and the game looks good. Like it still looks good in medium settings. Mm-hmm. Still, it's still a uh, very. I, mean, I don't want to say pretty, but I mean it's a, it's a I barren think... wasteland. But it does look good. Oh yeah, it, and if it's sort of if you can call anything Victorian pretty, this game is sort of icy Victorian yes. pretty. Yeah. So you start off, you've got your bunch of survivors all just crowded around this generator and you've got nothing else really other than a supply depot where you've got the very little supplies that you've brought with you. And there's there's basic resources in it in the game. There's like there's coal, there's wood and there's steel. Yeah, and in that um, supply depot, there is no coal, right? Yeah, there's no coal. That- the generator doesn't actually work at the start of the game. You have to get some coal. So the first thing you have to do is send some of those survivors out to get coal. And there's various like things lying about. And I got this is one of the things I got sucked in by the first time I played through. Yeah, me too. Was yeah, I think everybody probably <laughs> makes this mistake. Um, is that there's a bunch of resources just lying about, and there's like there's there's coal lying on the like ground. Wood crates there's wooden stuff. crates that presumably you've brought with you. Uh-huh. Um, and there's uh, there's like steel, just like bits of rocks and mm. with steel in and stuff that line about the place and you can click on each of these sort of different resource areas and say okay like send 10 workers to go and pick that up and that's the maximum right. you can pick that so you and then you see your workers get up and one of the things that i really liked about this was that you know the whole place is covered in snow and as soon as you send your workers to one of these things they start wading through the snow and they make a path and the more they go up and down that the more the deeper the sort of trench amazing. gets and yeah. it's really you know it's pretty cool when you just watch it, I, I sat and watched that for a while, and you know, one of the things that you shouldn't do in this game is sit and watch things. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have time for that. Um, but you know, I did that, and then you know, your wooden crates, and eventually these things all run out. The coal runs out, the steel all runs out, and if you've not like by that point set up something to actually start getting these things, you are in a world of pain. Like um, I will quite openly say that I drastically failed my first playthrough of this game. And um, but I learned a hell of a lot from that playthrough, like about what not to do. One of the bits of advice I will give you in this game is, um, get started very early on getting your resources sorted out. Like you really, really, really need to get those mines out. You need to get those steel places out. You need to get the the woods, uh, the the woodwork, the workshops out, whatever they're called, the woodcutters places, because there are frozen trees dotted about the place that you can actually send people to chop down if you've got this woodcutter's place. You really need to get this stuff sorted out. Don't make the mistake I did of just like, ah, there's plenty of wooden crates left. That's lots of wood for what a god. Oh, god. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you have to build shelters for your people and one of the things I really liked about this game is the way that it's done on a radial grid. So you have your big circular generator in the middle and everything that you build goes around it. And you have to build out in levels and layers, basically. But the problem you have is that the generator only heats things so far at the beginning of the game and only heats them so much. Um, and there is a research thing in this game as well, where like you can unlock um, various things. Like You can make the generator heat further, you make it heat even more, like a higher temperature. Um, there are lots of other things that you do. And you need to do these research things in order to create some of the resource buildings that you need. Um, and you can do things like you can create uh, research heaters for your building so that you can then heat these things up um, and you really need to keep on top of that uh, and you, you <laughs> I don't know Pavel how far through you got, how, how many days roughly did you play through? Oh no 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 the, uh, my, my first experience was not being able to even run it so I've changed the graphic settings and then I've sort of started again So did you just dabble with it and then uh, a little bit, and all I've done is because right. b- because my my city builder experience was mostly based on Anno two two oh five. I was I didn't even sort of fully comprehend that I have control of my workers. Instead, I thought that this is all about uh, buildings and nothing else. So I couldn't figure out for the for the hell like how do I actually collect coal to start up right, the right. generator? I built some like something. Uh, 
I wasn't doing anything. And at some point I'm like, oh, there's, there's coal. I should build a, a road to get to this coal. You know, things like this. Um, so I, was, I, just, I could see that I'm failing badly because I've managed to do nothing. And in the, in the meantime, <laughs> there were like four or five events taking place. People uh, coming up with various ultimata and, and asking me what sort of difficult, like depressing decision to make and... Well, you know, the more you stand about doing nothing, the more likely people are to come to you and say, "Why are you doing nothing? Like, we need, we need this, we need this done right now." Like, um, and yeah. then you have to start making promises. But I, I mean, I'm going to get to that point in the game. But um, the reason I'm asking you why, like, how far you got with it is, but I don't, you notice the timeline thing that moves at the top of the screen that yes. shows you like the days ticking away, basically. And there's Just to make you even more it. stressed out. Yeah, so there's little marks on that timeline to say the temperature is going to drop at this point. And then the next mark says the temperature's going to go back up again. So I was just like, the first time I played this, I thought to myself, ah, right, okay, the temperature's going to fluctuate. It's going to go up and down. No, 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 no. That's just like, that's selling you a dummy, that thing. Because the temperature drops, and yes, it then goes back up again. But I think that the reason to do that is to show you that what happens when the temperature drops and how cold it actually gets. (laughs) Because... We started the game, I think it's minus 20 when you start the game, uh-huh. okay? Um, I think the point I'm at now is minus 80. Oh, God. And it is so difficult to keep things heated. So it's not just like day, day night cycle, it's, no, it's no, the no, actual no, sort no, of no, like no. seasons changing. It's just the temperature's just dropping all the time, basically. Oh, <laughs> God. Cool. And this it's getting so out. difficult because the th- the lower the temperature drops the more you have to research things like uh, you can put heaters into buildings you can put up heating like uh, pillar things basically that just give off heat in a certain area um, you can research things to make your generator heat things further heat things more um, but it's never enough and all of these things need coal to function and you get to a point in this game where you have not enough workers and too much coal to mine so you can't keep everybody alive and people get sick if they're cold they get sick so the the more you ignore the problem the worse the problem gets because people start to get sick when they're sick they won't work when they won't work they're not mining coal they're not digging your resources up so you can't build anything to actually deal all right, with all cool. this stuff it's, I, it just becomes like it's a rolling ball a problem like a uh-huh. you know like a giant snowball rolling yeah. down a hill you know it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse the more you do nothing about it all right um and you know, I'm, I've not even gone to like the difficult decisions that you have to make in this game, and that's already like just keeping things heated is the, one of the biggest problems you'll have in this game. Um, and there are ways of getting other workers. I mean, you do have children, okay? You do have children, and eventually, I'm assuming that they will grow into adults. But you you can enact laws in this game, and some of these laws are so grim, including child labour. Um, and at first, the child labour law was just like, they'll only work in safe places. They'll only work in places where the chances of them getting hurt are very minimal. It'll cause, you know, people to become a little bit unhappy. But, you know, you need to, you need to do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. But then there's a law linked to that, which is like, no, you can send the ch- children to work anywhere. They could die. Like, <laughs> they could die in industrial accidents, you know. And it starts to just get really grim because then... And you learn uh, things about yourself as you play yes, this game. Yes, you do. And you, start to, you do start to... So, like, there's a point in the game and the first scenario, the main scenario, where... Um, uh, sorry, I should say before I describe this, there are two bars in this game. There's hope and there's discontent, mm-hmm. okay? And you want to keep the hope as high as possible and the discontent as low as possible. Mm-hmm. And those are the two bars that will really drive things. But there's a point in this game where, you, again, you're sold a dummy by this game where you feel like, oh, God, everybody's really hopeful. And people wake up in the morning, every morning they wake up, and you get little comments from the difference of like citizens that are saying things like, I think we're doing really well here. You know, like, or, you know, if you're not doing so well, it's just like, what's the point? You know, it's like, they'll just say stuff like that. Um, but then there's, a, there's an event in this game that happens at a certain point where a man turns up and collapses outside your city, and he's not one of your men. Um, and he, like, brings some pretty harsh news, and then the people want to go back to London, and you get the Londoners event, and the Londoners start causing so much discontent, and all your hope just drops. Like, so all that hope that you built up and you thought you were doing so well, this game just fucking pummels that out of you. So like, essentially, it's the English uh, that are at fault. <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to say that. But, <laughs> but it, it's... The, the game keeps throwing stuff like that at you. Wow. And it just becomes... and it, But it's so cleverly done as well. It's not like it's just deliberately being harsh. It's like, you know, this this probably the kind of thing that would happen. People want to go back home again, mm. you know? And, and at that point in the game, you get asked to make a choice as well between how are you going to deal with 
all this ridiculous loss of hope and uh, like the massive discontent that's being caused. And you get two choices. One's faith and one's order. Now, my first playthrough, I managed to get to that point and I failed quite dramatically Uh because I chose the faith option um, and you had to start building churches and stuff like that to keep people happy and I failed. Okay. And the city cast me out into the snowy wasteland and (laughs) off I went to die. (laughs) Um, Now, in my second playthrough, I have chosen order and discipline. Oh. And there are I now, would have never there are now, expected in that. In my to be... city, there are now guard posts, there oh. are now watchtowers, there are, there's a prison. Uh, Chris, <laughs> what are you God, becoming? I am keeping control of this population with an iron fist. Like, Honestly, <laughs> this game should be sold to, to every single gamer with a Wii webcam that just takes a picture of you as you start playing it and then at certain pivotal this... moments of the game, it should just take a, just shoot. Take a picture and then show you a gallery of your own faces, just so that you can well, see you know, how you change. Games are escapism, but I feel that like this game may have changed me slightly in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, but so I the other main thing of the, the game, like I say, um, is the difficult decisions and the stuff to do. Like, what do you do with the dead? Um, like, do you? Over- oh my god, is there cannibalism in this game? And uh, not that I've seen so far, but you can't just leave corpses in the street because it makes people so miserable. Mm, so, do you awesome. do you build a cemetery? If you build a cemetery, that makes people happier. But it also means that every time somebody dies, a whole bunch of the population goes to the funeral and stops working. Bastards! Um, but, but you could also build like a granary right next to cemetery uh, without explaining <laughs> well, you, why. But, yeah, but you can just you can just build a corpse pit. Okay. Which doesn't make people happy, but it stops them from from, from not working. No, it stops them from having funerals. Yeah, because you're just tossing bodies into a pit. Could, um, could you not put them in the generator? Uh, yeah, well, that's actually not a bad idea, Dave. I mean, I, I wonder if we can sign a law to, to make, that, make that happen. I might write to the makers of the game and see if we can put that into it. Um, I'm sure they would be delighted by an idea you, you, like this. You have to start making these decisions. The problem is you can't just make a decision like these things will come up. You can make these, you can act these laws yourself or sometimes, you know, if as soon as the first person dies, um, somebody will come to you and say, what are we going to do with this person? And then you have to make a promise and you have to then fulfill that promise. And that promise will be like enacting a certain law and then building the suitable buildings to go along with that thing, for example. Right. And if you don't do that within the specified time limit, my God, your hope and discontent will go crazy. Like Mm. people don't like broken promises. Um, One of the other things, uh, you feel the pressure of a politician on you. You do feel the pressure of a politician, but I mean, there's other things that you, other things that you do like, so like, you can overwork people. You can enact laws that will make them work 24 hours a day in one place oh, just fantastic. as an emergency situation. And I've had to do it so That's many times. That's what they say at first. Because I can't keep the coal generation going. I can't have them stop and working at 6 o'clock at night and then go and stand around next to the generator when they're just eating up coal by doing that. I'm like, no, you have to work for the entire day now. You're 24 a terrible hours, go. boss. But you can also make them work just overtime, so you can make them work like a couple of hours later or something like that. It makes people unhappy, you know, that's just what happens. It's just... Oh my god, I'm looking at you and it's like a completely new person. But you have to make these decisions, so it's like either you do this or everybody dies. and Or even worse, I get sent out in this snowy wasteland. That's even worse, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I um, gotta, so, uh, sorry, question. You start with like a hundred people or something like this? Oh, it's much less than that. Oh, okay, fair enough. So... Uh, is the population growing at all? Yes, because one of the things that you have to do, and thank you for that, because I was, I was about to go into this, one of the buildings you have to build as part of this scenario is a scout, it's a beacon. All right. um, and when you build the beacon, you can send scouts out. Now, when you send scouts out, that's that's five workers that you are sending out into the world that you can't do use for anything else. But they go out to look for other survivors. And there are survivors from your expedition that got broken off that you can go and find them. Um, there's other people that you can find and you can send them all back to the city. But then you have to make decisions about those people when you find them as well. Because if you send if you if the scouts find some people, you get the choice of like just sending the people back to the city. Now if you do that, some of those people might die. Okay? because they don't know the way to the city. But what you can do is you can send the scouts with them. Mm. If you do that, everybody stays alive, but then your scouts are coming back to the city and not going out further to explore, because it takes time for them to go places. Yeah. So you have to make decisions like that's that, or cool. you can just leave them to die. You can just leave them to their own devices. <laughs> and that's the, really, the, so far, the only way I've found to grow my population is sending scouts out. Okay. But I've never got enough population. And yep. at the same time, I've never got enough resources to house them all. I've never got enough resources to keep them hot- heated. It's such a massive problem. But I, like I say, I'm always amazed when I get through it the next day. 
do do resources as such, and I, by, by resources I mean the actual raw resources that you gather, do they deplete as in to the point where yes, you have to because you, yes. you won't be you there won't are, be able to relocate yeah. ever. You're you're, the, you're bound to the research. Crater. There are research ways of getting around this, uh-huh. but again, like, that all costs resources to research things and build the buildings and all that sort of stuff. So you have to be prepared for all these things. It's mostly just like a like a timeline question, because if you're playing whatever standard, uh, say RTS, for example, and you're whatever mining Vespine gas in StarCraft or something like this, you know, things just deplete and you have to move on. Whereas in this game, you're always at the site of your, of your generator. So does it mean that the game has to end at certain times simply because there's no more crates no you know, broken i don't movie. think so because i think one of the things that you can research is digging into the side of the crater yeah okay so uh, this is what i mean i sort think like the, there are research notes. ways okay. around these problems as okay. far as i can tell i think each scenario does have a definite end goal uh-huh. um but at the moment i'm not entirely sure what it is other than just surviving for as long as possible um i have another question sorry um, so your workers, because each of them has a name, possibly an age, gender, maybe. Yes. I'm not sure if gender yes. is actually in it's relevant way because relevant. you can because okay. people do get married and have kids. All right, um, and that probably uh, in some way affects their hope and some miserableness as well. Yeah, uh, because that's what children do. Um, oh yeah, like if somebody's spouse dies, yeah, they become unhappy. Okay, yeah, I suppose. Um, do you micromanage these people at all, or do you... Not really. They don't have skills really, you just assi- like this. You just, nah, you just assign them to jobs. Right. Um, I mean, there's different classes of workers. There's the workers and there's the engineers, and engineers are your higher skilled people, and they can are the only people that could work in, for example, like medical posts okay. um, and that kind of thing, uh, and like research labs, stuff like that. So and your workers are the people that will go and do all your coal mine. You can send the engineers to work in mines and stuff like that. If you've got, like, I've got an excess of engineers mm-hmm. that I can't really put in any building, so I've just sent them out to mine stuff and gather resources and do this and that. Um, so at the moment, yeah, there's two classes of people, but... All right, yeah. that's cool. Um, oh, there's... But, oh, I forgot to mention this, actually. There's one other way, like, getting rid of discontent, which is uh, you can build a fighting pit. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of every day, two people from the, the city will just go and swedge it out for... <laughs> for a couple of hours and everybody will watch and cheer and it makes people happier you know so you do these things because if it makes people happy everybody wants to see a fight so oh my uh, god so you're essentially uh, when, when you when you pick your your police whatever uh, like watch guards and and prison um sort of routes you're You've got you've got your gulag all sorted. You've got people fighting uh, just to entertain others. How do you feel about it, Chris? Welcome to Russia, Pavel. <laughs> I was just gonna say it. It doesn't sound like <laughs> English to me anymore. <laughs> um, right, we are gonna have to like wrap up here because we have talked about that great length. Well, I, I mean, really the thing is, the game is so. Uh, see, this game is so atmospheric and it's so absorbent and like I played it for. I don't know, like maybe nine hours or like a couple of Sundays ago. Like just non stop, barely eating, just because I was like, Oh god, what's going on? I need to fix all these problems. But like remember a few weeks ago I talked about surviving Mars, which is another city builder set on Mars and stuff like that, right? If you compare these two games, um like so surviving Mars is like there are no there aren't really that many agonizing decisions to make in surviving Mars. It's so much more laid back. Um and, you know, in that sense, it's a different game, but I don't think I can go back and play Surviving Mars anymore <laughs> because Frostpunk is just too absorbent. Uh-huh. Like, there's too much going on in it. And, like, and yes, it's stressful and it's depressing, and but at the same time, it's just such a better game. <laughs> like, How long do you think it is from start to successful finish? I would only be guessing if I... Do you, do you have I'm a feeling make, that I'm not going to make that guess. Through after not, nine hours. I, I don't feel like I'm that far through the scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've still got I've still got a decent amount to go. Okay. Um, but at the moment, I'm still just solving lots of problems. Um, I've kind of ground to a halt a bit in terms of the actual story side of things because I've got too many problems to deal with elsewhere. But the thing is, I think one of the things about this game is that if you really want to go through the story, um, you do you can't really grind to a halt on it. You have to keep going because remember things are the world is just going to constantly get colder. So you have to just, like, go for it mm-hmm. um, if you really want to go through this. You don't want to be spending ages just messing about in this game because things are only going to get worse. Um, <laughs> uh, 
so I th- this I mean I've I've got a little like the way my laptop's set up uh, I have a lot of icons on my desktop because I'm one of those people who arranges them into little groups um, and I guitar. I've moved uh, Frostpunk into the sort of my favourite games area. Oh, the, the permanent icon! It's, 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 it's <laughs> so. going to be it's going to be a permo. It's a permo on the desktop. Uh, I, I just I'm enjoying this game that much. Okay. So Pavel, get your finger out and play this. Well, I've I've got I've got three columns of Steam uh, shortcuts on my desktop. And the, the the very right hand side column is the permanent icons. The remaining two columns are sort of temporary, um, and this one hasn't advanced yet to the permanent one because I have to actually play it. But but there you go. Uh, you've really convinced me to give it a go. Uh, but I want to I want to do it properly. So when I have a day off, and possibly dying after the tough mother without because like, I'm I'll be properly miserable and this is when the experience will be the most immersive I think. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it sounds I, almost suicidal to do. No, that. no, no. Because the thing is, I'll be satisfied, but also knackered. So you know. All right. Fair enough. Okay, right, that is uh, Frostpunk, which is by 11-Bit Studios. It is on Steam. It's, I think it's on only on Steam at the moment, Microsoft Windows even. Um, but I do think there is a PS4 version coming. I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Um, I will confirm that in a second. Yes, Frostpunk is coming to PS4 later this year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this game was only released, like, what, uh, a couple of months ago, mm-hmm. last month maybe? Mm-hmm. So, uh, it is. this is a brand new game, really. Um, so yes, it is coming to PS4 later this year, as did this war of mine and everything. So lovely. Okay, let us move on. Um, Pavel, you're going to do some more chatting right now because you are going to tell us about Detroit. Be- become human, Detroit. Become human. become human. Yes, yes, that is the plan. I could obviously talk about BattleTech, but I'm thinking let's maybe do it. Let's talk about Detroit. Become human. Ah, <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I can. Detroit Become Human is a is an adventure game or an interactive movie if you if you want to describe it this way, made by Quantic Dream and Quantic Dream is the company that sort of tends to do these very things because they've done um, they've done uh, Fahrenheit. Also they've known done, as Indigo Prophecy. Uh, also known as that, indeed. They've done <laughs> Heavy Rain um, and Beyond Two Souls. They've also, I've just realised, uh, they've also done Omicron the Nomad Soul. I'm not sure if you guys have, oh, ever, that's have you game, played that. No, that's the game with David Bowie in it. Yes. Oh, you know, yes, it is. I remember that Yeah, very it's actually, well. I remember it in the day. It was, it was pretty, uh, like, strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but definitely stood a out. Different, a different type of game from the four. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, because, it felt more like Deus Ex, early yeah, Deus Ex. Since, since, the, since they did Fahrenheit, they've been trying to get that game to work and be good. I, I, I think I think you've you've said it well because it's it's you could say that they're trying to master their own sort of uh, way of doing things but the, the the truth is as much as I enjoy Fahrenheit it was in many ways uh, uh, Fahrenheit has the great the greatest first 30 minutes of it was any very game impressive. and then goes steadily downhill as it goes, and it has all sorts of other things. That it, are terrible it's not, a, about it's not it. a broken game, but it is. No, but it doesn't fulfil its promise. No, it does not. It it does disappoint. But, you but then point. what they're trying to do is difficult. Mm. I would say. And ever since yes. then, they're trying to master this. Yeah, so they they come up with heavy rain, and it's in many ways, in many ways, a success. Uh, I I really enjoyed heavy rain. Uh, it's a pity that the. The scenario cannot be sort of redone because I saw a potential there for replayability and changed roles, slightly slight tweaks that would do it. But no, it's fully linear. But where then you get beyond two source, which is not up to many people's liking and uh, potentially just a little bit of a failure. I think maybe I'm not sure. I did not really much enjoy it. Yeah, I didn't play that one either, but I know people were. As you say, we're a bit less keen. Heavy Rain was somewhere in the middle. Some people liked it. I was l- wasn't was hugely sold on it myself, but it wasn't a bad game. You I could... found Heavy Rain to be hilarious more than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know what you mean. It, I just wasn't... I couldn't take it seriously. I just couldn't get into it. And, uh, yeah, it was just... I know. I totally know what you're talking about. It and... just didn't really quite 
work. I'm going to say straight away that the Detroit Become Human is very similar in many ways to uh, Heavy Rain in terms of what the game is like, um, what the game is supposed to work like with controls, with essentially what the challenge is like, um, how you do things in the game. Yeah, so you're giving... At any time, you're given control of a character, third person. Yeah. You can wander about an environment yeah. as part of the story. Yeah. Interact with things. And your interaction is essentially your right stick, uh, which has to go through some strange, easier or more difficult motion in order to get your character to do the most basic things. Yeah, it's always been a bit weird that way. And you can talk, and, talk to people. Yeah. But there, there's lots of... Usually something is going on. Often in the older ones... It, they would make you do quite menial things in, at some points you in know order what? to in order to somehow the idea that you would be immersed in the game by yes, being forced yes. to make if a your cup female of tea. character goes to to have a shower and you have I don't know maybe thirty or forty different actions yeah. like put soap on uh, rub soap in uh, <laughs> and you know things like this but at other times you're doing things that, are, <laughs> that, that is that how you shower it's how, it's how Polish people shower. <laughs> <laughs> Just Polish before shower then keep pierogies. rubbing, keep rubbing. <laughs> Oh no, that went south way. Okay, right, sorry. <laughs> but then other times other times you're doing things that are more involved and exciting and yeah. heavily plot based. And sometimes under a slight time pressure. You get uh, your QTA, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um essentially every every single stressful situation or a fight is just quickly press this button or quickly press these buttons in succession. So have they still stuck with that? Very much so. Oh, I'm, I'm, Detroit Become Human is all that. I'm, I'm baffled that they're still persisting with. Well, this is this is what they've been trying to master and if it can be mastered... But, but mastering then... quick time events that everybody's decided <laughs> Which, that they hate. <laughs> that everybody hated after Shenmue. Um, Detroit Become Human is just that, really. Okay, but... Is that are, they, review? are they? No, no, no. no. <laughs> there is things to mention. As in, this game is actually if you're if you're okay with quick time events and and the type of gameplay that you saw in Heavy Rain. Mm-hmm. If you're okay with this, if you're happy to sort of interact with your game this way, then obviously Detroit Become Human just presents you with with you know a different a different story. Uh, and as much as I'm into science fiction, uh, I would still debate whether Detroit Become Human it actually gives you a better story than what uh, Heavy Rain gave you, because Heavy Rain was actually a, well, a semi-proper investigation uh, and crime sort of mystery. Yeah, that was the theme, Yeah, certainly. Yeah, well at some point it becomes something else, obviously. Yeah, and this was always my slight beef with it, is that the theme was very strong in these, well, of the two that I've played. Unless, a- until then, it changes. And then I was, well not that mm. so much, but yes, there is that as well, but it was more on the surface the theme was there and I didn't I never really felt like I was truly involved and in control because you can do things and they do have an effect on things that happen in the future yeah yes but a lot of the times they didn't and I think in this particular case because let, let, let's face it, this is the this is the most difficult aspect of making a game like sure. this. If you're making an interactive uh, gameplay experience, you want to convince the player that their choices and their actions aren't just flavor. And, and this, I think, I've only played one third of Detroit Become Human so far, and I can say... Okay, let me put it this way. The, the game consists of chapters, yeah? Because you, 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 you jump between character to another character. You've got three androids you play as. You play as Connor, who's the sort of experimental prototype uh, detective, uh, detective, I should say, android. You play as Marcus, who's also a prototype, apparently, and he's a household sort of disabled person assistant. Uh, mm-hmm. And you play as Kara, who's essentially just made... Um, and every chapter is maybe a single scene Um, and as soon as you finish it you go to another within the chapter uh, the choices you make uh, definitely can lead to to multiple sometimes very different uh, outcomes and you sort of start uh, seeing the, uh, the bigger picture as you go through the chapters again I've only played the one third of the game 
but I can already tell that this game could have gone very different depending on some of the chapters. Not all of the chapters, because mm-hmm. the, the, a few of the beginning ones will be sort of tutorial-like. Um, but I do wonder, as you know, I still have plenty to play, how uh, more sort of variety in terms of um, just plotline uh, there can be, because there seems to be quite a lot. What this game does is, and this is probably the, the main novelty, uh, every um, sort of chapter you're in, you see, uh, you, you're given a flowchart. You can go into a menu and, and you can see the entire flowchart of all the possibilities. And and these flowcharts um, are, I think actually they're part of the marketing, as in, look, this game is supposed to be about it. And it mm-hmm. quickly becomes about it, because even if you're sort of emotionally invested in the choices you've made... The flowcharts. As you, as soon as you finish the the chapter, the game actually brings up the flowchart and shows you all the choices you've made and how how exactly your entire sort of plotline uh, went through through this chapter. And you see how how many sort of crossroads uh, you've mm-hmm. completed in what way. Obviously, all the choices you haven't made are sort of locked, and you cannot see what they actually are. So, even though I don't generally speaking do it in games like this and I can only compare to Mass Effect which was quite sort of famous for uh, consequences of your choices at some mm-hmm. point uh, and I, I I found myself never able to play Commander Shepard in any way that I always play I might just sometimes punch somebody that otherwise I would not but just Commander Shepard sort of become became a, a, a character in my head and just had to behave in a, in a specific way and I have a feeling I'll probably play this game in a in the same way because the characters are well uh, sort of semi well done and you do still sort of get get used to them after a while but the very first chapter that you uh, get to play and this was also the uh, the gameplay demo which they've uh, released I think a good couple months ago you could play a single chapter of Android Become Human uh, for free and try it because it, it's a very good sort of representation of the entire experience is is this is the first chapter in the game and this is where Connor the the det- detective Android uh, just conducts it's not an investigation although it sort of starts like it but essentially it's all about uh, preventing um, a de- deviant uh, android, so the android that is sort of uh, acting against its programming uh, mm-hmm. is dangerous, from jumping off the roof with a with a child hostage. Um, and as you go through this chapter, um, I've completed this chapter probably about 15 times, uh-huh. uh, just to make sure that I've seen every single uh, possibility, I've unlocked every single note of the flow, uh, of the flow chart. Uh, there is this chapter alone has six different endings and the endings are as drastically different as obviously Deviant uh, jumps off the roof with the child or you kill yourself whilst whilst saving the uh, the child or you get killed and then the Deviant jumps off or you know all, all yeah. sorts of possibilities um, how your deaths uh, are treated by the game later on, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, obviously you're an Android, so you probably just download it into a different body or whatsoever. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I cannot confirm it because once I've started playing it properly, I've not had an. Action you're making character. your own game now, pal. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but um, so flowcharts is probably the the most interesting uh, aspect of the game, well, and it keeps you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering because you say that you played through the chapter multiple times. Did you then just pick your favourite ending and continue from there? The chapter one, to be fair, I've, I've only done chapter one just to um, deplete all the options, just to see what the game is about mechanically. But you're not going to do that for all the chapters, surely? No, because my no, That goodness, would just be that, time-consuming as hell. Um, there's going to be people that will probably want to do it, because there's. I'm, I'm betting there's some sort of achievement on PlayStation, like unlock every single bloody node in the entire game and then get whatever platinum. But that's not really for me. And no, I've just done it in the first uh, chapter. And then I, I went through... Uh, I went <laughs> once. Once I've decided, I've done it all. I've seen it all. My goodness, this game is a bit crazy when it comes to flowcharts. Let's go from the very beginning and do it the way I think Connor should do it because this is the sort of character I decide he is. Uh, and then I just moved on from there. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, flowcharts are definitely uh, an interesting uh, way of doing this because 
In games with multiple choices, you usually find yourself at some point uh, jumping on Google and checking through various wikis and guides and checking what sort of you know decisions you could have made. Either you're a completionist or you're just curious, whereas this game made this an actual part of the gameplay, so that's fine. And to be fair, quite fun. Um, Apart from this, uh, I should say that the game is absolutely pretty to look at. It's mm. really pretty. It's like uh, as as high uh, as as good graphics as PS4 can stomach, I guess. And it's a very nicely designed futuristic world as well. So, uh, so that's that's a that's a bonus for me. I always like settings like this. I do have a little bit of a problem with it, and I think quite a lot of reviewers picked up on on, on this as well. As much as I enjoy the the you know do androids uh, dream about electric sheep sort of um, uh, well theme, uh, this game is uh, potentially uh, making some missteps or g- generally. Uh, the, 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 the quality of writing is uneven. You'll find it that sometimes the characters are behaving and, and, and talking in a way that you would consider fine or even, you know, well-crafted. But there's going to be, like, there's a lot of cringeworthy moments when, when characters are just uh, saying heavy uh, meta stuff without any reason or there's certain elements of the game's lore that just doesn't, just seems out of place. Um, very sort of these naive moments when a girl that hardly said a word uh, and it's, to be fair, I don't know, like four or five years old, suddenly starts talking to an android about why why does my father not love me? I just want him to love me. You know, things like this just very bluntly said and just mm. uh, um, <clears throat> or the, the, the android Marcus, I should have probably said spoilers, the android Marcus who is essentially just a uh, a mobility uh, assistance uh, assistant for for his uh, owner, uh, just in the very probably first chapter, as soon as his owner kicks the bucket. Sorry, spoilers. Uh, and he's like, "Oh no, dad!" And it's just too early for things like this. You're not invested in characters well enough. You don't know them. You've not seen them open well enough for things like this and they're already showing their human sides you know they're supposed mm. to be bloody androids and then the the world is crafted like really in a in a sort of like really believable way um and then suddenly uh, uh you find your character just crawling through this junk pile of uh, mutilated uh, discarded androids that's i don't know what it's supposed to look like some sort of cybernetic hell and it just doesn't, it shouldn't even be there and doesn't make sense. Or it's just. It's uh, a shame to hear that because I think that has ultimately been the issue with their games. Is mm. the, the quality of the writing is what's let it down. It's heavy handed. It's, it's at points, it's just feeding you with this big spoon yeah. of too many flavors that don't go well together. I, I appreciate it. it's a huge task. In every generation, it becomes a bigger task to make this kind of game and so much effort has to go into just the mechanics of of getting it to work and it leaves you less budget and less time for voice acting and going through the whole thing you know going through it over and over and over and saying well look if I do this and then the next person replies such and such it doesn't really make any sense in Mm -hmm. this particular situation and no. each of those games is getting better at this, and this one is really good at most of its aspects. So you, and, and that's probably why it's a little bit painful because, as as amazing as this game is, at some point it just you have to stay back and realize this could have been handled in such a more sort yeah, of subtle way. They're all written by the same guy, though. Yeah, they're all written by David Cage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe you like know. it's not it's not like there's a new team of writers that they're getting in to try no. and fix the problems it's the same problems are we, are we blaming him just now Chris well, well I'm, not, I'm not blaming him for anything this is just yeah. the style I suppose but yeah. like perhaps but I mean perhaps. they're games aren't they they're not films you're not watching a film or anything oh, but but he really sees them as he sees films them as films because right. I remember watching so he, his sort of making of or uh, whatever it's not the making of there's a thing on Fahrenheit where there's a little Avatar right, right, of him, okay. and he talks about what his aspirations are or were for that game, and he's 
definitely a film guy or that's the impression I got I was like this is really trying to make so, so the interactive the to- movie that everyone dreamt of years and years ago I is he the Tommy Wiseau of uh, games no 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 no. I, I disagree I disagree <laughs> oh, he's got his moments sorry that was a bit hard <laughs> it was. no no but he's, he's an it's actor really, it's really it's that sort of thing most, most of the time the, the, the narration and the, the, the world sort of and character presentation is is on par of as in it's it, it's just decent or even good, but at times it just like slips and yeah. and really falls, and then you have to just pick yourself up. I mean, it, it's difficult. I mean, one of one of the best games in this kind of genre would be the Walking, the Telltale's Walking Dead, the, yeah. fir- the first season of yeah. it. But the thing with that is that that game is actually quite linear. Mm-hmm. But at the time, it doesn't seem like it. This was the genius thing about it. When you played it, you were totally in the game. And then afterwards, if you cared to go back and have a little look about how the game works, you're like, oh, actually, a lot of the stuff that I thought I was in control of, I wasn't in control of it at all. Yeah. But it seemed, yeah, it you, really seemed like I was. You got the same outcome regardless of the choices you Yeah, made. but when you played it, you were like, oh, Oh, everything is I'm right. so in this game but Guys. so it's easier when it's when it's more linear like I mean there, it wasn't totally linear by any by any stretch but like when it's it is the much more linear thing, so yeah. it is way easier to uh, to make I'm, a convincing really, game in I, that I, scenario I need to just re, re, restate something uh, there is there's moments when things get like cringeworthy but this game is really on top of its game I should say so it's a big improvement you would say or and it's uh, it's because your your initial uh, impression are actually very high and and you you get to trust this game that it's going to keep uh, right. keep the sort of uh, narrative all the time and just slips from time to time sure. and you realise yeah, this could have been much more subtle. You you sort of you bat your eye for a bit, and you you, you keep going. But you play this game for it. Not you you won't probably find a game that would be less linear than this, even though you're going through a story because there's so many different uh, choices you get to make and and consequence combinations you yeah. get to see. And you you play this game for this thing alone. I think you'll be quite satisfied. Okay, cool. So that's uh, Detroit Become Human. That just came out recently, didn't it? Quite so recently, like two uh, weeks ago or yeah, something. May, maybe, maybe a month, maybe less. Actually, may, may, it uh, might be right. Two, two or three weeks, weeks ago. Twenty um, fifth, twenty fifth of May. <laughs> yeah, so that's only like what three weeks ago. You were right. Yes, there we go. So uh, that's by Quantic Dream, and as we say, written and directed by David Cage. Um, Thank you, I'm David. Actually, I've got Beyond Two Souls there, and I was going to ask actually. Do you Guys think that this is something I can sit and play with my girlfriend. My girlfriend hated Heavy Rain. Uh, I believe there is a... Depends why she hated it. She thought it was really depressing. Yeah, well, well, this one's going to be a bit grim as well. She didn't play it with me, so I don't know if uh, the person she was playing it with uh, got one of the worst endings out of it. Like, one of the hilarious endings. I, uh, um, so, because because I, I think I got the best ending out of it when I played it. I saw an opinion but. somewhere that people that hated Heavy Rain quite liked or even loved uh, the other one, and vice versa. Okay, right. So I, I may I may be able to try and play it because uh, it's sitting on my PS4. I think uh, it was free on PlayStation Plus. So a couple it was months I downloaded. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I was I was maybe going to play play through it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, Detroit Become Human. Thanks very much, Pavel. I, I wish they were androids to begin with, but they're very humane. From... I think there was a couple of times during that where you referred to the game as Android to become human, but we'll let you I got, Oh my god, I keep doing this! Spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, we've got one more thing to talk about, and it's uh, Dave's choice this time. Let's go for it. My choice. Today, I am going to talk about the Red Strings Club, Woo! Woo! which is <laughs> by... Uh, Deconstruct Team, and published by Devolver Digital, which is probably what drew me to it, because... They yeah, they've made a, some pretty good games. They have a really solid catalogue of uh, games on Steam, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Red Strings Club, there's a lot of similarities between this game and what Pavel has just been talking about, okay. uh, just by coincidence. It is, a, well, Steam builds it as an adventure game, and when you look at it visually, it, it, it is very much, it does have the look of a, an old school side, side-on point-and-click Adventure. It's in the the pixel graphics, which I, I believe a, a very famous games reviewer said are neither pixels nor graphics. <laughs> I'm not, not sure what you meant by that exactly, but <laughs> but when, 
th- this is not an adventure game. This is a visual novel, I think, is probably the, the closest description I would give it, or a narrative experience, as they like to describe it in uh, the Blurb on Steam. Uh, they say it's a narrative experience involving people's emotions, bartending, and pottery. <laughs> yep. This sounds like the game for you, Dave. Yes, yeah, well, so I thought. Uh, <laughs> so, the, there's there's no uh, no uh, spoken voiceover dialogue in this. It's all written stuff on screen. Uh, and it's a cyberpunk game, so... Pavel's ears perk up. Pavel, yep. It does sound tempting straight away. Yep. Uh, and it, most the majority of it takes place in a bar, and this is the Red Strings Club of the name, and you primarily control the bartender there, whose name I have forgotten. But anyway, we'll call him John. Uh, <laughs> Cyber John. Cyber John! John, John, John 2000. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first... Th- now, unfortunately, the first thing I noticed upon playing this game is the writing. It's... The, the quality of it, I, I would say, is a little bit jarring. It's that slightly naff side of cyberpunk uh, like the, the one of, quote attempt to jargon yeah the, 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 one of the first things one of the guys talks about is hacking his way out of a robot police car uh, and it's got all the tropes sounds quite tongue in cheek though no it's it's not though it, it, like oh. there's all the tropes they're all smoking all the freaking time right, right. Uh, in this dim, French dimly lit bar and I mean, Blade Runner's got a lot to answer for in, in that regard. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it is a bar, so that is part of it. But in the future, everyone smokes, but maybe they're future cigarettes, I don't know. Uh, and they make references to contemporary stuff as well. Like, I'm sure Twitter or something gets a mention. Okay. And that just totally that annoyed me so much. It totally, <laughs> and this is all right in the first, like, few minutes. So I would be furious if somebody mentioned Twitter to me. On a cyberpunk world. Oh my god! Yeah, so, I mean, it's a bit odd, but I will say, you do... I did adjust to it, and I, I played this game several times through, and the, the the times I played subsequently, I didn't even notice it at all. But it, it does take a little bit of adjustment. So, you, anyway, you're you're talking to the, the people, and the first thing you're going to come across after you've had your little chat is the bartending side of it. And this takes the form of a mini game, possibly the second most annoying mini game I have ever had to play. <laughs> Uh, although I should say a lot of this is to do with me playing it on the touchpad on my PC. I'm sure it's much less annoying yeah. if you're playing with a mouse. But even so, but it is a big bartending is a big part of the game. And what it, uh, the bartender's called Donovan, by the way. Donovan, Donovan two thousand. <laughs> and <laughs> what? You as Donovan, you're chatting to your patrons. There'll be one of them sitting in the bar, and you're going to have a little chat. And this is how you advance the narrative. I mean, once you get the story going, the core part of it is you have to find out certain things about this story, this stuff that's happening. You've got a list of things that you're trying to discover and various people are going to come into your bar and talk to you and you're going to kind of grill them a little bit, but through a, a kind of chat. And Donovan's power through his bartending is to be able to mix cocktails that change people's mood. It puts them in a certain mood. So you have to think about... the you have a list of different moods basically and you have to think about what mood you want them to be in before you ask them the right. questions that you okay. have from your list and you do this through the bartending mini game the moods are up there they're like a bunch there's like four circles and then the, the, there's a circle that starts in the center of those four and basically the, the, you've got four different uh, liquors that you can pour into the cocktail and they move the center circle in certain directions. Oh my god. <laughs> so you're like, oh, I need a bit of the tequila or the go right juice and then a bit of the up juice. That's like proper alchemy. And then you have to line it up because I, you know, I want them to be uh, depressed or I want them to be upbeat or uh, angry or whatever the lists are there and it's different for everyone you talk to. And that's what you do. I mean, it's not what I look for in a bartending simulator. It's incredibly, <laughs> I, well, it's incredibly irritating to have to do this because you could just choose, you know, you could just choose one of them. Why do I have to, but, you know, this yeah, is yeah, a, you're yeah, making yeah. your cocktail. This, that's how it is. Uh, and that's what you do. And there, Before I go on, there is something else you have to do pretty quickly after this, and that's the pottery side, as it calls it, or the, on the future lathe. Uh, this is another mini game that you have to do, 
and this is the most annoying mini game I have ever had to play. It's absolutely appalling, completely pointless. There's this lathe that is like a pottery wheel. You have to click the mouse button to spin it up. Oh God! Because like. Uh, you know, because that's obviously how it's going to work in the future. Like electricity no longer I'm exists. I'm confused. <laughs> you have to, it's like a it's like an old fashioned pottery wheel that you're like kicking but with your what, foot. What does pottery have to do with with patrons in the bar? Oh, this is separate. This is outside the bar. You don't. You're not always in the bar. There are some other bits. I don't want to spoil the oh, you story. Have, you have a side gig. Yeah, there's a bit where you control one of the other key characters who's a kind of android, if you like, and it's her job to give implants to people that change their personality slightly. And she does this by manufacturing that weird gel on a lathe and then it gets stuck into their chest. <laughs> so that's that's how they're made. I'm so confused. Uh, basically, you spin this thing and you have to make them a certain shape depending on which implant you want to give to each person. And there's a whole thing with... You know, they ask, they come in with their various requests to the clinic, and they're like, "Oh, I want to. I'm a social media person, and I want to get more followers." And you give them the thing that uh, makes them more charismatic online. And here is here is gel for you. Yeah, and then they come back and they're like, "This gel will give you more followers." They're still not happy. <laughs> And it's that whole thing. It's like, oh, do, you don't give people what you want, what they want. You have to give them what they actually need. And right, yeah, th- yeah. this is only something that you do, thankfully, at the beginning of the game. But I guess, I mean, a horrible mini game aside, it does kind of get you into the idea of the game, it's sort of the theme of it, which subsequently takes place mostly in the bar with Donovan doing his drinks and talking to people. And it's hard to describe why this is interesting. <laughs> But it kind of is, because there's the whole thing about trying to figure out what mood to get them in before you ask them a certain question. And if you choose the different, you know, the different moods, you'll get different answers from them. And sometimes it's the answer you want, and sometimes it's something different and not what you expect. But a lot of it is about trying to figure out the personalities of the characters. So it gets Mm. you thinking about people and like, you have to use a bit of conjecture You've no real way of knowing. So you have to sort of guess a little bit or try and fill in the gaps yourself. It doesn't give you all the information that you need in order to do this successfully. And then after you've spoken to someone, they either, you know, they give you some information or they don't. Uh, It doesn't matter. But you have to do a little quiz. Oh. Uh, Your little android friend that I spoke about later, she's in the bar now with you, uh, helping you. uh, And she gives you a little quiz about the person you've just spoken to. You get like 10 questions and they're things like, is Jane 3000 attract, physically attracted to you? Right. And like, at no point have you asked a question, hey, do you find me sexy? No. <laughs> That's not one of the questions you can ask. Well, surely you can and see it why, in the pixels. This is why you never pulled it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, are they, are they depressed? Are they, ha- you know, what are they most afraid of? Why is this thing cyberpunk? Oh, it, it, it just is. is, 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 it, is you tell me, pal. Robot bartenders. You tell me, pal. Is, is it because is it because there's some sort of gel-based technology that alters people's behavior and? Cause uh, yeah, the, it's kind of. I mean, it's just part. It's the story. There is a whole story that you're getting into that's to do with this android uh, girl, and it's a quite interesting story. There's something going on that you find out about. It is slightly noirish, and that you get pushed into this, caught up in this thing that you weren't weren't originally supposed to be involved in, and you talk to the various people. And you get the information from them, and also you are making key decisions. There are bran- they're not branching points, but they're a little bit like your flowchart. And these are the red strings of the title. Aye. You can check, and it shows you when you've activated a certain thing. So there'll be like four things that could have happened, and you right, you, you right, will have right. maybe uh, chosen one of them, like made made Janet four thousand uh, doubt herself or something like that. And you can see them as you as you go along, uh, and all that culminates uh, in a sort of finale and the finale is actually quite good you do you do some actual hacking but without mini games at all really this is the best bit about it i like you actually engage in social engineering 
that's the type of hacking you do. All right. And I was like, well, this is really cool because this is an actual thing that happens where you like call up and pretend to be someone else on the phone and trick them into giving you information. Right, right, uh, right. And that, that's how the whole end bit plays out. And it's actually really cool. That does sound pretty cool. And all the bits that you've done before may or may not play into it. And you get all the way through to the end and you get a sort of ending for the story. Uh, is this game set up so that you play through it multiple times, though? Uh, you can. But how long does a one playthrough take? About three hours. Right, so it's not like that. It's not, not a long, long game. You don't have to play through it multiple times. It's not. You're not going to get a dramatically different experience. There are different things that happen, and not, not everything happens at the bar, and occasionally there's bits that branch away, and you, depending on what you do, it will affect the finale, especially, as in, like, who's available and how people react to you. But they're not dramatic changes like it's the the ending is always the same <laughs> it's interestingly mm. uh, so it's that kind of thing it's more about your path through it changes but in subtle subtle ways rather than a, a branch where you're starting with one node and then branching out and then it branches right, out right, again right, and yeah. you could end up somewhere completely different no you're always the finale you're always going to be doing the same finale so I, I played it through I think twice, at least. Possibly three times. Just out of interest. I should probably uh, play it as well, because it's cyberpunk. To see what would happen. The uh, things, I don't yes. fully understand why why cyberpunk bloody uh, bartender. As a person who doesn't drink alcohol, I don't really pick up games yeah, about see, see, Pavel, so you, you're coming from a position where you think cyberpunk is a very serious affair and should not be toyed uh, with. <laughs> um, whereas other people don't. Really yeah, I've noticed. Yeah. yeah, I was I, just gonna say that there's another actual cyberpunk bartender game on on Steam. It keeps popping up on my Steam. It's called Valhalla but, uh, Cyberpunk Bartender. What yeah. the hell? Uh, it's just a thing now, man. You're just gonna have to deal with it. Shopkeeping simulations are becoming a thing now as well. In fact, so, um, <laughs> the main themes of the story are cyberpunky themes uh, to do with like people's wills and is it okay to make people happy. Well, that yeah, I think that does thing. fit in a cyberpunk. That's a very cyberpunk thing. Yeah, like yeah, definitely. Like the, the idea of free will and um, you know whether you whether it's right or wrong to change somebody's personality yeah. for the better or, because yeah. it's those are very much so. your questions. Yes, so Excellent. there you go, Pavel. There's there's your cyberpunk. Thank you. There's your cyberpunk. I am. There. But that stuff's You're in there. Very and much. I would not say that's the main draw of the game for me because you've probably seen those themes a hundred times before yeah. in other things and, and done probably better. done better. <laughs> so I, I just liked the You're whole, in it for the mini games. The aspect of... <laughs> <laughs> the the hated mini games. <laughs> Chatting to people behind a bar and then answering quizzes about them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went, I went many ups and downs. I initially hated this game and then I kind of got into it and I didn't like it. And then by the end I was like, it's our, I'm okay with it. So your moods kept changing. This 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 actually ah, yeah, see, it's deliberate, valid. Dave. It's deliberate. Yeah, maybe people love this game. By the way, uh, mm. that's why I bought it. It's, I I don't quite understand why it has why it's resonated so strongly with people. I think it's a certain type of person, possibly the sort of person who might spend time on Tumblr. Uh, <laughs> But that's just speculation. There's fan art for this game, which you wouldn't, Damn. you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. Oh my god! For like We're, such a small. How, how many like groups of people have we isolated in this podcast? <laughs> Just, just right, our well, listeners before, should probably be aware that Dave judges you whenever you play games. Dave has got a category for you. <laughs> You're being labelled. Okay, right. Before we uh, we go down any more of those rabbit holes, um, let's let's just move. <laughs> let's, just end, let's just end that there because we are going way over time here. Yep. Um, so that's Red Strings Club. It's by uh, Decon- Deconstruct Team yep. um, and Devolver Digital, uh, who like to make all these pixely things, don't they? Um, and it was released twenty second of January two thousand eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, this has been sitting on my wish list for a while, um, probably since it came out, actually. So I think I'll add it as well. I'm curious. I mean, I think I would probably pick it up if it was in sale, but I think you've, you've pretty much told me everything I need to know about it now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, let's wrap up there. Um, we will give out all our internets, so you can email us if you want to ask us questions, give us comments, anything you want us to read out on the show or anything like that. Please send them to us. It's firstplayertoken at gmail.com. That's F-I-R-S-T, player token. Uh, you can find us on all sorts of social media. Again, it's the larger than necessary first player token or first player token. Um, specifically, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter. Um, we have a YouTube. We have a PSN community. Um, we can be found on SoundCloud, we can find on iTunes, we can now be found on Stitcher. Um, I don't even know what Stitcher is, but It's that's just another cool. podcasting thing. Fair enough. Uh, a podcasting thingy. Ah. Um, so yes, like I say, everything there, it's the first first player token, large and necessary first player token, the exception being Twitter, which is at 1st player token. That's a uh, once to player token. Thank you, Dave. Well done, fake human. <laughs> we have a Discord. If you want to come and chat to us in there, it's discord.me slash first player token. Um, my Twitch username is Unnecessary Chris. Again, I'm mainly just playing Fortnite Battle Royale. Ask everybody um, on the just planet. Everybody, just every so often. I mean, you're lucky if I'm on once a week at the moment, but, you know, I've got a lot going on. Um, and we are part of the Podnos Network. The UK's leading entertainment podcast network. Thank you very much, Dave. I'd ask you if there's any news, but I know that that's you and Dream It, so um, we'll, we won't go into it. But if you want to go and find a whole uh, bunch of podcasts of a variety of topics, um, we are part of that network, and you can go to podnos.com to find all of those. Um, we should be back next week. We uh, will have a board games episode in the bag at some point soon. Uh, we don't know if it'll be next week, but probably the week after, if not. Yeah, I um, think so. But we're going to have quite a few things to talk about on yeah. that, I think, because we've got some uh, got some pretty cool stuff lined up. Uh, so look forward to that. But yes, probably video games next week. But until then, thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Bye.